Okay, guys, so we finished up our last lecture with humanism, and so we see that there in about the 1950s that uh, psychology really starts branching out because we have a lot of different responses to psychoanalysis. So with the rest of this lecture, we'll go ahead and wrap up our schools of thought. All right, so today we're going to start with cognitive behavioral therapy. And basically, cognitive behavioral therapy, it's the evolution of behaviorism. So if you remember, behaviorism is all about observable behavior. It's about how you react to some type of stimulus. Remember, they don't look at that mind-body connection. Not until they kind of get to the end and Skinner there and uh, operate conditioning where we have to put in motivation. Then that that kind of brings that mind body connection back in a uh, back in a uh, focus. Right, guys. Sorry, my phone's ringing. I, I'm not going to get up and turn it off though. It'll it'll be over in just a minute. And so um so basically with cognitive therapy they put that mind body connection back into behavioralism. So that's what we're looking at. Cognitive is the mental processes, behavioral is our behaviors, right? All right. So uh and this is another one that uh, kind of came out in the 1950s, and uh, it's actually regained popularity here recently. It seems like cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of the preferred treatment plan for most mental disorders, and it really just comes down to this idea of uh, change the thoughts, change the emotions, change the behavior. So, you know, it's really looking at how all three of those work together and, uh, you know, then how, how we display that through our actions, through our behavior. And so it's really all about, you know, finding ways to manage and cope with stress and just uh, life skills for managing any situation like I have right there. And uh, as I said, it, as I have written there, it's been good with treating depression, um, anxiety. They use it a lot for that. Sorry, I've got allergies. Um, usually what they do is uh, now with therapy, it's usually a combination. Whereas like in the past, you were a psychoanalysis. That's all you used. You didn't even look outside to any of those other fields of psychology. But nowadays, we're definitely more uh, holistic and, and kind of borrow and take from a little bit of everything. And that's a big part of cognitive behavioral therapy, too, is being focused on the present there. And like I said, it's just a way to, uh, you know, change those, uh, those, those thoughts and emotions that don't serve us. So we can say it's changing those negative thought patterns and behaviors. All right, and so our main theorists are Beck and Ellis. They actually came up with the ABC of cognitive therapy. Basically, with the ABC model is that you have an event that uh, happens and it triggers a thought, and then that in turn triggers a certain type of behavior. So you get fired from your job that's an event that that triggers a na negativity in you okay you get fired from your go from your job then you start having uh feelings of thinking that you're worthless and you're hopeless and you're a bad worker and then what does that lead that leads then to depression and so you're going to have those depression type behaviors and so you know when you change that so, all right, you lost your job. That doesn't mean you're worthless. That doesn't mean that you'll never get another job. Look at it as a, uh, you know, this is one of those good things when, you know, you close a door, you open a window, however that saying goes. It's like, you know, this is a good thing for you to go out and, uh, you know, really find what your gifts are and the job that you're going to excel on. And so then what does that do? That kind of keeps you in a more positive, upbeat type of um mentality and then that just helps uh you know that just helps you in your life there i accidentally did this wrong right here guys don't ever put people's first names in the citation there it's always going to be the last name and the date my bad <laughs> All right, and then, like I said, so uh, there in the 50s, as a response to psychoanalysis, we see a lot of different approaches and theories come about. 
and to help us explain human behavior and that mind-body connection. And each of those has contributed a little bit to our overall understanding of human behavior and just the human experience overall. And so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. So since about the 50s, 60s, we've become way more integral and holistic in our approach. And so integral psychology, so when it comes to these ways of thought, we know those first few four are structuralism, functionalism, behavioralism, and psychoanalysis. Some people consider humanism the fifth wave, but really that fifth wave is uh, undetermined. So everybody kind of fights with fights about it. So back about a couple of, about 20 years ago, a uh, psychologist Ken Wilber comes along and he comes up with this idea of integral or uh, holistic psychology. He actually calls it integral or integrative a psychology and it's just uh, you know once again it's looking at it's taking a holistic look so you know it's not just focusing on one thing like the behavior is just looking at behavior or psychoanalysis just looking at this traumatic thing that happened in your past you know holistic uh, psychology it's about looking at the bigger picture kind of like gestalt we'll talk about that in just a minute but the, I guess what makes it different from uh, Gestalt psychology is that it's all about kind of finding a balance, finding harmony, you know, like I have right there with mind, body, spirit, emotions. And then, you know, it also has uh, opened up a lot of different therapeutic techniques. And you say I have some of those there, dance therapy, art, equestrian, other types of animal therapy, meditate, me mediation I should say meditation and ecotherapy <laughs> and uh, let's see what are some other ones other types of mindfulness based practices things like yoga there's actually screen therapy some people even do like a work with holotropic drugs which would be kind of like psychoactive drugs and so uh, just a lot of different things going on right now with holistic psychology and out of holistic psychology we also have transpersonal psychology and eco psychology and so they're really looking at so with transpersonal psychology we're looking at how things like soul and spirit and, and spirituality relate to our mind body connection and then with eco psychology and we're really throwing in the natural environment so we're looking at you know how the natural environment plays a role in our thoughts emotions and behaviors so it's kind of a little bit like environmental psychology all right so once again uh just some uh information here about ken wilbur you'll see it right there it says i'm not a big fan of ken wilbur but uh you know that is i am just one person and that is just my opinion there are plenty of people who do like him so i would challenge you guys to kind of uh you know if you're interested more in him study up on him and then you know tell me what you think of his theories the one thing i do like about ken wilbur is his idea of consciousness he says that consciousness Consciousness exists exists on a spectrum. So you know, think of it like a like a spectrum, like a rainbow. So you've got that kind of arc type thing. And so consciousness, we have all really and there's all these different levels of awareness and and that's very true when it comes down to consciousness. As you'll see later on in class, there are different types of consciousness. And unconsciousness that we do have in different uh, uh, transpersonal types experiences that relate to consciousness so I do like that consciousness is a spectrum and then good old John Davis John Davis was my, one of my instructors he's a lovely lovely man and uh, very fascinating so uh, he was schooled in, in typical Jungian psychology so that means he had a bit a lot of a uh, a psychoanalysis mixed in with the Jungian elements there in his background and he's also one of the main creators of transpersonal psychology and like I said that's looking at that at, at the spiritual aspect of being human and then it's really exploring how all those different states of consciousness and kind of states of reality that kind of go beyond what we consider normal consciousness how those all play a role in just uh, what it means to be human and how we go about 
finding our gifts and uh, self-actualizing. So it's about, you know, how do we find what, what makes us unique individuals so that we can have optimal happiness and well-being in our life. And then, you know, that's how then you set that example for others. And then starting in about the 1980s, so well, we'll say very, um, 1970s to 1980s, about when we, you know, see, uh, we see kind of another movement, and it's just more, once again, about psychology becoming more holistic, being more uh integrative, being more inclusive, so that we weren't just focusing on specific groups of, of human beings. We were actually looking at everybody and everybody's experience of, of being human because things like our socioeconomic backgrounds, our races, our cultures, ethnicities, our religions, those all play a role in our happiness, health, and well-being, right? Mentally, spiritually, physically and uh, so you know psychology the job of psychology the goal of psychology is to help is to help others help make people better help make society better help make ourselves better and uh, you know the way that you do that is by uh, breaking down those barriers and, and overcoming those biases and, and prejudices and learning how to relate to people on a, kind of on their level is, is I guess a good way to say that because you want to realize that not everybody experiences the same the world the same way that you do and uh, you know in order to help people find their special gifts for society you have to have some empathy compassion and understanding for what other people go through in life so uh, multicultural psychology is just about that it's about helping us find those similarities in our differences and then it's about helping uh, uh, all groups of people fi find ways to heal so we see things like uh, emancipation circles sweat lodges and then once again transpersonal and eco psychology and then of course multicultural psychology there's also a lot of a uh, very Eastern and you know, Stoic type uh, stuff thrown in there. Just once again, uh, there's indigenous stuff. It just depends on what that person's cultural background is there. And then, uh, as I said, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy seems to be pretty popular right now. And uh, positive psych. So, as far as therapy goes, cognitive behavioral therapy is what's uh, popular right now or at least using that in some combination of uh, other therapies and then the main paradigm that I would say psychology is in right now is positive psychology and positive psychology is all about how we achieve that maximum uh, health and well-being so that you know we're we're as happy as we can be in life life is going the way that we would like it to go we're using our gifts for society and ultimately you know we're learning and growing and that just helps make conflict lesson in our life that just helps make shipment helps us get over challenges more easily not more easily well mm -hmm. It does make it a little bit more easily when you have, you know, the right mindset and when you when you have that focused and, and kind of calm mindset, you know, it, it really helps. And, uh, you know, the biggest way that it helps is in our communication because uh, we are social creatures and we do have the ability to verbally communicate with each other. So um, it never hurts to be more mindful in those engagements, right? There's a saying that we have two ears in one mouth so that we listen more and talk less and I just think that that is a great saying there all right so hopefully that has given you guys a little bit of time to read over what I have written there so when it comes to defining, oh, okay, let me say this first. So positive psychology, like I said, it was probably about in the 70s is when these ideas started, uh, uh, Siegelman, uh, Dr. Siegelman started uh, coming out with his ideas. And so positive psychology was presented by Martin uh, Siegelman. I think that's how you say his name, and Seligman, something like that. And... Um, 
and you know it's a little deceiving because of the because of that word positive it makes it sound like it's all unicorns and rainbows when we know life is not all unicorns and rainbows right guys and so that and, and so that makes it hard to define but a good way to think of it is that positive psychology is not about life being all unicorns and rainbows because it very much acknowledges that we have negativity and conflict in our lives that we have to come uh, that we have to overcome and in overcoming that you know it's something we have to do to keep learning and growing so it's kind of like you know negativity and conflict aren't necessarily bad things you know we kind of make that reaction and make those emotions and thoughts in our heads you know anything that we are ever present any situation we'll ever present it with in life we can always turn it into something that's more serving and productive to us and so the positive and positive psychology is really more about addition not about positive and negative and and you know that effect type way but more as in an addition Positive psychology is more about finding those things that add to your life. You know, it's about finding ways to take those challenges and concepts in your life and turn those around so that there's something that, uh, like I said earlier, that something that serves you and something that helps you grow in your life journey on this earth. Because ultimately, that is what life is about. Life is is a unique. A unique experience where we get to learn and grow and I hope that that never ends you know <clears throat> all right let me see so that just yeah we're gonna uh, wrap up positive psychology there if you guys want to read that last slide I'd certainly invite you to do that sorry my nose keeps it my allergies are driving me nuts today I don't know what it is all right so now i want to talk a little bit about gestalt psychology and uh, we're kind of going backwards in our timeline just a little bit because uh wordemeyer came up with this as a response to structuralism so we've now kind of jumped back to the 19th century and the reason i kind of save it for later on is because uh, i think it makes a little bit more sense now that we've reviewed all these other phrases of thought so uh if you remember structuralism it was all about trying to measure and define consciousness and it did it by looking at by, by breaking down the mind into those basic elements remember how Tixer broke those down when he came to America with structuralism and so Wordemar was just like that's that's just uh it's too one-sided it's too uh um narrow of a focus you know because we have to when, when we're going to look at things like consciousness and try to figure out human behavior we just can't look at one specific thing you know we have to step back and look at the overall picture so that's why he uh, proposed gestalt psychology and it's gestalt because it's, it's actually a German word it means the sum of all parts so it just means that we're looking at everything you know overall and so you know they're looking a lot on perceptions sensations you know how we perceive patterns whole figures you know to be like how our mind works and shapes the reality and our perception of reality around us so it's very relevant to cognitive psychology so so we can kind of jump back now to the 20th 21st century and that leads us to cognitive uh, psychology. So these are, um, uh, like I said, when it comes to the subfields of psychology, they're pretty um, enormous. <laughs> some of them overlap with other fields. Some of them overlap with them, with themselves. If you guys uh, know in the discussion there, I got that little genogram, which is like a little psychology family tree. So. Um, I know it's super tiny uh, writing on there, but uh, I think that you can at least uh, distinguish to some of those. And if not, you at least get an idea of the vastness and, and dynamicism of the field there. So, and thinking of Gestalt psychology and how it was looking at how uh, our perceptions and our sensations relate to consciousness and, and uh, our behavior, cognitive then psychology is really 
it's kind of once again it's the opposite of behaviorism with cognitive psychology we're not really looking at behaviors we're looking at what's going on in here so they're more about those cognitive mental uh, uh, processes and uh, neuroscience neuropsychology would kind of be a part of that too so then we kind of get a little bit into biological psychology like I have there too biopsychological perspective and this is when we're really <coughs> We're really focused on those inner workings of the body and how that affects behavior. So we're looking at those, those neurotransmitters. We're looking at hormones. We're looking at heredity and DNA and, and you know, trying to see how all of that plays a role in our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And then the evolutionary perspective or evolutionary psychology, um, you should, uh, hopefully you remember that from our last lecture when we talked about functionalism and William James and Darwin. And that's kind of when uh, evolutionary psychology came about. And it's just really looking at the, what, what behaviors are adaptive or are survival mechanisms. And then, you know, in that aspect, it's also looking at maladaptive behaviors, too. There's another one we can add in. Uh, hold on. I'm trying to think of how to officially say the word. Psychopathology, I was thinking pathocyte, that's not right. Psychopathology and abnormal psychology. I still said it wrong with me. Anyway, abnormal psychology looks at psychopathology, which is like, uh, you know, diseases of the mind, mental disorders. And really, when we say mental illness, mental disorder, mental disease, all we simply mean by that is the brain gets sick. We know that the brain can get sick. We know this from uh, biological psychology. We know it from the medical fields. You know, we know it from uh, having advances in technology. So we can see, we can see differences in the brain. So we can see when the brain is sick, like with uh, CAT scans or MR, the CAT scans. You know. Or we can see, uh, you know, when the brain is well, and so we can compare those. And the good thing about it is that just because someone has a mental disorder, it doesn't mean that they can't get better. You know, the brain gets sick just like any other part of the body. And once again, that's something that evolutionary psychology really likes to look at. And then the last one that I want to discuss is sociocultural psychology. And this is really just a, a combination of sociology and then cultural psychology. So basically we're really looking at behaviors in group settings and then how those uh, compare or contrast, you know, call it cross culturally, because you know, as humans, we don't live in isolation. We need each other to survive, and so uh, social cultural psychology or social psychology, cultural psychology. We you'll find in psychology that sometimes we have more than one word to explain the same thing, because that's one of those little things. Everybody in psychology wants to leave their little mark, and so they made up their own word for something, or want to call their theory something just a little bit different so you know don't get confused by that you should by the end of class hear them so many times that that you'll be like oh yeah i remember that that one's that that one too you know so overall with psychology and like we see with all these ways of thought you know we're just getting into we're just looking at that different spectrum of human behavior and and you know uh, focusing in on different parts of it and then you know trying to bring it all back together as a whole to uh, help us explain the human experience so that uh, we can all find our unique gifts for society and live you know those uh, lives of optimal happiness health and well-being and that just wraps up our uh, I think uh, this is just a paraphrase of what I was just sharing with you guys <laughs> so uh, what I want to do is uh, just take this last few minutes give you guys time to uh, look over that real quickly but uh, these last few slides I have oh let me move my little box here so you can see that one there. Oh, that's why I said Aaron T. Beck. I thought I put his name in there, but that's the name of the place. 
So that citation I pointed out that actually is right. Oh, 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 yes, 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 that is, that is. I, I remember what that one is now. That's a website, so when you have a website without an author, you use the organization as the author, and then Aaron Beck was the name of the like little article that I read off that website. But uh, that is one of the reasons why I am sharing these is because I want you guys to see some of these ways I've done uh, these citations because you'll see there are a lot of journal articles. Some of them have those DOI numbers. Some of them just have their retrieved from. None of these have retrieved from. Like this one right here. The Kaplan Transpersonal Psychology, that was an actual paper journal that I have, so that's why I don't have Retrieve From. But if I got this offline right here, I would put Retrieve From and blah, 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 whatever that URL is. There should. There we go. Mm -hmm. That should be italicized, that psychologist there. But there you go. You see, I got that one offline, the green. And so I have retrieved from, and then my URL there. So just want to share these real quickly. Of course, you guys can always pause this recording to look at these. But just, you know, really good examples of different types of sources. And really the main sources that you guys are going to use are going to be books, journal articles and then you know reputable websites and I believe that is the last of them. Oh, I will put these up in class for you too. So if you're interested to know a little bit more about um, some of the, these are the only ones I have for you. So if you're interested to know a little bit more about behaviorism, humorism, humanism, <laughs> humorism, humanism, Freud and psychoanalysis. I've got some great videos here. None of these videos I think are over like 10 minutes. Maybe the one on humanism might be about 15 or 18 minutes. But they're all really short and uh, very interesting. And uh, these are all uh, experiments and people that you'll see throughout the semester we're going to keep coming back to and talking about. So I would recommend that you go watch these. I will make sure to include those in the description link with the video. That concludes the end of this lecture, guys. And that is the end of our Schools of Thought lecture. And uh, if you guys need anything in class, just feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, guys. You see you in the discussions. Bye.